today as well as our Zoom audience at home. Uh, we're very pleased to have you. Today we have a really special event. We have several uh, ambassadors and representatives of the EU, and they're going to be talking about uh, the impact of the war in Russia and Ukraine and other matters as they may wish. Um, and so we're thrilled to have them. I'd also like to give a special thank you to the World Affairs Council and its president, uh, Lauren Schwartz, for uh, hosting us here today in their beautiful spaces. And so we're grateful to them. Our, um, our moderator today is Dr. Ron Granieri, who is um, uh, no stranger to most of our audiences. He's the executive director of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West. He's also the host of People, Politics, and Prose program that we have roughly monthly, uh, PPP, which um, uh, usually interviews authors about their recent books. Um, so Dr. Granier, if he, those of you who don't know him, is also an associate professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College. He's also a graduate of Harvard and the University of Chicago and a former federal chancellor scholar of the Alexander von Hif Humboldt Stiftung. Uh, um, and Ron, I guess I do have to do the disclaimer that anything you say today uh, does not it represents his personal opinion, not that of the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. Army War College. Um, I'd also like to say a special thank you to our funders and members and board, and again to the members, funders, and board of the World Affairs Council as well. Um, I would, um, I guess without further ado, I introduce Ron Granieri. Thank you, Raleigh. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Delighted that you could be here both uh, in person and on Zoom for this conversation. Uh, we are, uh, th these kinds of partnerships between organizations here in Philadelphia, between the World Affairs Council and the Foreign Policy Research Institute are ways for us to, uh, let's say, to multiply our, uh, our bandwidth to, uh, to broaden discussions of international affairs in Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley. Uh, and this is a great way to get back to actually having people in a room to talk about things. So welcome. So over the past two decades, Vladimir Putin has aimed to split Europeans from each other and the EU more broadly from the United States, using both overt and covert influence to fracture the West and open the way for greater Russian control over its near abroad and in Europe more broadly. That strategy has brought no small amount of success over the past two decades. Paradoxically, however, Putin's decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine on 24 February of this year has backfired spectacularly, inspiring a surprising display of European and transatlantic solidarity. <clears throat> even as they face economic challenges that have come with the sanctions on Russia, and even as they face a cold winter without easy access to Russian oil and gas, EU member states have held together in support of Ukraine in favor of the, the principles of sovereignty and self-determination that Russia currently tramples underfoot. But winter is coming and election campaigns as well. Will this unity hold? What do Europeans expect in the months to come? And what will Europe look like in the aftermath of this shocking war of aggression? These are some of the questions that we will address today in our conversation with the distinguished panel of European ambassadors. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, uh, just so that you, we all know who we have here. Stavros Lambronidis has been ambassador of the European Union to the United States since March 2019. Prior to this posting, he served as the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights and as Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece. Between 2004 and 2011, he was a member of the European Parliament with the Greek Social Democratic Party and served as Vice President of the European Parliament. Andre Muraru has been Ambassador of Romania to the United States since September 2021. He had previously worked at the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes and the Memory of the Romanian Exile, and he was senior advisor to the president of Romania, Klaus Johannes. Dr. Muraru holds a PhD in history from the University Alexandru Ioncuza in Yashi, as well as an MA and BA in history from the same university as a fellow history major 
I find it very gratifying that you can go a long way with a history major. He is a university lecturer um, at the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration and a scientific researcher at the Elie Wiesel National Institute for the Study of Holocaust in Romania. Audra Plapita has been Lithuania ambassador to the United States since April 2021 and ambassador to Mexico since May 2021. Ambassador Plapita is a president of the executive board of the United Nations Children's Fund and has also been the director of the European Union Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs before being appointed permanent representative of Lithuania to the United Nations back in 2017. She's also been ambassador to Spain, among other positions. A graduate of, from Vilnius University with a bachelor's degree in philosophy and a master's degree, she also holds diplomas in international relations from the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University and in diplomatic studies from Oxford. And then uh, finally, uh, Ambassador Mariangela Zappia is the Italian ambassador to the United States. A career diplomat with over 35 years of experience, she is the first woman in her country to hold this position as she was the first woman permanent representative of Italy to the United Nations and to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. She's also been diplomatic advisor to the Italian prime minister and a G7 slash G20 Sherpa, something we'll definitely talk about. Ambassador Zappia has worked for a variety of organizations and she, uh, international, uh, including NATO and the UN. She has pushed for reform of the UN Security Council and she holds a master's degree in political science and international relations from the University of Florence and a postgraduate degree in diplomatic and international relations from the University of Florence as well. She is an active member of the International Gender Champions Network aimed at promoting gender parity and women's participation in decision making. So we look forward to hearing the insights of all four ambassadors in this discussion. And I want to start with a big question, give you all a chance to uh, warm up for the conversation. That is, how would you each of you characterize your nation's or organization's response. War in Romania. I'll start with you, Ambassador Lambrinidis. The war in Romania hasn't started yet, although it may <laughs> at some point. Yes, but uh, thank you. Uh, so as a EU ambassador, I will tell you that this response that we've had as Europeans has been an EU response uh, that has also relied massively on additional member state response. So it's what we call a team Europe response. Uh, we understood the moment the war began that Putin was not simply trying to wipe Ukraine off the map um, uh, just because they didn't like him. But it was he was trying to, as you said, um, uh, undermine the European security architecture in, a, in an existential way uh, and also undermine American and European unity uh, together or through NATO. So it was very important for us as European to respond collectively. Uh, and we did with massive sanctions, uh, the biggest package that has ever been imposed together with Americans uh, and also with massive military support for the first time in history, really the European Union itself um, gave two, two, two and a half billion euros, dollars up to now and more to come uh, to our member states to be able to support their own support to Ukraine because the EU itself doesn't have uh, a military, uh, member states have, have militaries. So I would say that this is um, a remarkable showing of European solidarity. And I want to tell you two things about this and close my, my initial re re reaction. The first thing is that um, in Europe to impose sanctions, any sanctions, let alone of this massive amount, uh, requires a unanimity of 27 European leaders. You've got 26 European leaders, you don't have sanctions. In the US, you need a president that signs a paper. I mention this because it's not naturally understood how those things happen in Europe. We are 27 independent countries. Uh, foreign policy uh, is a competence of the of member states, which is to say that if you're going to be doing things in foreign policy or defense policy together, you need unanimity. Putin was gambling. I'm sure he was sure that he wouldn't be able to get that unanimity and he woke up at a, to a very different reality. The second thing I'd like to say is that you cannot defy gravity. Europe is next to Russia, uh, the US, Australia, Japan and not. This fundamentally means that we knew the moment we imposed these sanctions that the hurt and the hit on the European economy would be harsher than anywhere else. Uh, we have been doing without the slightest um, hesitation, the heavy lifting 
of the negative economic consequences of this war um, and will continue to, uh, to do so. We'll, we'll keep the course. But, but uh, for many people in this country, um, look, at this may appear in, to some people listening or watching or being in this room, um, a war that is happening far, far away on the other side of the Atlantic. In fact, what I often say is that there's absolutely no safe distance um, when a, uh, an authoritarian sitting on nuclear wars has decided that his goal is to bend the will of the United States and of the European Union to his own, to tear up the UN Charter, to create new rules. This would be a world of tremendous insecurity, both geostrategic and economic for America and the, and the European Union. Um, the fact that we are re reacting in such a united way, and in this country, I have to say, I'm quite pleased, in such a bipartisan way, uh, is something that has allowed us to um, uh, stop the worst, and in fact, to support the heroic Ukrainians in, in, uh, in the resistance. And if we continue this way, I believe that we will, then, uh, then it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be a difficult war. Uh, it's gonna continue for a long while, uh, but we're gonna be okay. I'm reminded of a, of a statement that was made. The president of Germany years ago said that the uh, human freedom was being defended or European security is being defended in the Hindu Kush. And I'm thinking in, in different circumstances, right, that uh, European democracy is being defended on the Dnieper. That's absolutely right. Ambassador Zapia, your sense of your nation's response to the crisis. Well, first of all, I, I, I'd like to, uh, to start from where you left, sure. and it's not only European democracy <laughs> that is under under threat, as as uh, Ambassador Lambernidis was saying before. Um, difficult to add much. I think really the um, the big thing that is happening is this show of unity in the European Union and in the transatlantic relation, which goes um, really uh, very far. Much, uh, far, much more far than we could think. If you think about um, what happened in NATO, the expansion of NATO uh, and the accession of, of Sweden and Finland. Um, if you think about the U Ukrainian perspective of membership in the European Union, something that Italy has really uh, fought for from the very beginning and, and, uh, and a decision was made. Um, if you think of all this, it gives you really the, the sense of uh, how wrong was the calculation of, uh, of Putin, of President Putin. Um, having said that, I, I also want to add that um, this show of unity came uh, also before from the fight against the pandemic. Um, I said it this morning in a different setting. Uh, I strongly believe that um, the strengths that we were able to show during the pandemic, how we took care of our own people in Europe, not only um, in our own countries, um, has, has been something that really has strengthened the idea that the Europeans together can really um, react uh, quickly in the right way for their people. And, and we did something that was really unprecedented, uh, this recovery uh, plan, uh, Next Generation EU, and not by chance it's called Next Generation EU, because it's a plan that really looks at, at the future of the European Union. I think this is also something that we have to consider like a base of the show of unity that we were able to uh, um, uh, to show precisely uh, responding to these uh, unbelievable aggression. Um, and and uh, so I believe that there is a lot of good. Uh, now I see also um, a risk. Um, Ambassador Lambrinidis was, was saying before how difficult it is at 27, for instance, to, to devise uh, one after the other, not only sanctions, but, you know, military uh, support to Ukraine, uh, um, refugees, uh, dealing with, uh, with refugee support to Ukraine, to, you, to the Ukrainian people. All this doesn't come without sacrifice. Um, and our citizens are uh, very much feeling feeling the the pain of all this. So I need that. I, I believe that in in being so strong in our response, we do not have to lose sight on the need 
to, to find a solution to this. Um, we don't want a war in Europe that lasts forever. Uh, we don't want frozen conflicts in Europe. We, we, and so the moment there will be a possibility is not now, unfortunately, but the moment that we see a possibility, I think we, in the same united way, um, we have to work for peace. And I will stop here. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. As uh, President Kennedy said, right, we should uh, we should never negotiate from fear, but we should never fear to negotiate if we need to. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Pleptieta, please. Thank you. I just have to echo also what my colleagues before said. The, the war uh, showed the re how all the Western countries reacted, the speed, it was immediate reaction, and how big it was the worldwide coalition, I would say, of democracies, not only transatlantic US, Europe, but it's also involved Canada, Japan, South Korea, Australia. I think that also showed the, the strong, the strength, how the Western world can react to such barbaric thing as uh, full scale invasion in the 21st century could have, could have believed some, some, some years ago. I think it's, it's, it's very important that we will continue as well on, on doing that supporting Ukraine, how it goes, also continue the, the sanction as well, and what hasn't been also made the strengthening NATO Eastern flank, which is, I think it's it's also very, very important. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's also what the Lithuanians feel and how we'll see, they really see that it's not only war for Ukraine or like territory, it's really war for our values, for our freedoms, for, for, for democracy and everything. And especially now listening even last uh, intervention by Putin, what is clear, he is not fighting already against the Ukraine. He's fighting against the whole Western values of democracies. So we have to be that in mind as well, continuing and supporting that and making sure that we will win, Ukraine wins, and we win and Russia loses because if it's not that, we knew already, we had already 2008 uh, war in Georgia, 2014 annexation of Crimea, and now it's the full scale invasion in Ukraine. So we know if he is not stopped, if we are not strong enough showing support and ensuring the victory, it'll never be what would be next or something like that. So we have to be, and of course we are facing also difficult things. And that's saying that we also fighting not only when that's energy war, which started as well, the pressure or propaganda, disinformation, trying to disconnect us to, to make some uh, different tensions between us. So we have to be united and we have to be to face that, to explain our people and um, to each other to talk and to be, to see that, to ensure that we go for the victory. Right. <clears throat> this I, this this idea of we have to find ways to communicate at the upper at the high levels of government, but also to our peoples and across our peoples to understand what we're fighting about. And if to say, I can ensure from the Lithuanian at least population, until now we showed all the solidarity with Ukraine. Every almost every Lithuanian opened their houses to take the refugees from Ukraine. We have about two, three percent of Ukrainians of our population as refugees. So they got the schools, where to live, social benefits and everything. Um, another small example, just a couple of months ago, we are not even three million population, but in three days, two and a half days, Lithuanian raised like five million euros for to buying drone for Ukrainians and all this still going on for the people, something like that. So I'm pretty sure that we will survive the cold <laughs> and expensive winter, something like that. But still, I mean, we have to understand that we are fighting in that as well and, and support as much as possible and to see how we can solve that together, all right. these challenges. Thank you. Ambassador Muraru, so from Romania's perspective, the war in Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
as my colleagues um, underlined, so facing a war at its uh, borders, the European Union responded in a sound, efficient and decisive manner. And of course, the United States did uh, a lot of great things with a broad bipartisan support, but without European Union, uh, uh, it, could be, uh, it couldn't be uh, so effective. So it's obvious that we are facing uh, and witnessing the gravest security crisis um, uh, on the European continent since the uh, end of the World War II. And uh, of course, for Romania, it was a, a very difficult uh, situation. I mean, Romania uh, has the longest border uh, with Ukraine uh, of any NATO and EU members, more than 400 uh, miles. And uh, the Russian aggression uh, has created the most serious humanitarian crisis on the European continent and the biggest displacement uh, of people in our times. Uh, and uh, since the invasion started, more than 2.5 million people crossed, uh, Ukrainians crossed the Romanian border. Uh, and uh, Romania did uh, great things. I mean, Romanian people have provided fellow Ukrainians uh, food, shelter, and uh, overall warm welcome from the very first days uh, of the invasion, even um, before the invasion started. Um, and uh, such compassion has uh, been very energizing and has been also very consistent to this day uh, and no fatigue uh, whatsoever. So uh, in the same time, uh, Romania is doing its best uh, to support the economic viability of Ukraine by facilitating the grain exports to through its territory. And until today, more than 4 million tons of grains tra uh, transited Romanian ports uh, so that's been 60% of all Ukrainian exports since the invasion started. Uh, besides, almost 1 million tons of other goods were exported to uh, Romania. Romania was the first European country to start importing, el importing electricity from Ukraine uh, and one of the first countries that liberalized the road transportation from, from Ukraine operators. So in the same time, uh, we're doing great things uh, from military perspective. My government uh, doesn't speak about that, but be sure that we're on the front line uh, on, of this support. I have... I have... I have questions, but I'm sure you do as well. So I want you to know that I'm looking on the audience. And so I'm going to go with Trudy Rubin has a question. Trudy, I, we got a microphone coming to you, I think. It's always good to offer the first question to the member of the press. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Trudy Rubin. I write a foreign affairs column for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Putin's latest speech about the Satanism of the West um, I'm, and his latest nuclear threats. Have these nuclear threats uh, strengthened the EU's will to help Ukraine at a time when it's making major uh, advances on the battlefield? Or have they weakened uh, EU unity? Uh, out of fear of the uh, possible use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's number one. And I would like to ask Madam, uh, 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 forgive me, uh, the Italian ambassador, how will your change of government affect Italy's uh, support for a strong EU position on, on Ukraine and continued arms and strong position versus Putin? If I may just take the first question, uh, you may have seen that the, um, uh, the 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 foreign affairs ministers of of the EU issued a joint statement um, uh, recently, and the leaders as well, um, in which they, after the nuclear threats and after the referenda, and they unanimously expressed the answer to your question, which is not not only are we not afraid of Putin now, but we're even more committed in a united way to respond to what he did. The European Commission announced a, a new proposal for, for sanctions, the aid package coming up. Um, and uh, the military support we're beginning to the Ukrainians together with the Americans actually is continuing and is probably going to go up. So um, I would not in the least be concerned 
um, that uh, Putin's uh, threats, I don't want to say bluff. Some people say it's a bluff. I just don't know. I don't particularly care if it is or not. I'm, I, I'm, I'm done thinking about what Putin really is thinking about. What I care about is what we're thinking about, what our interests are, and our interests are that he cannot win this. Uh, it is existential for European security, for world security. Um, it's existential to to all of us. Uh, but as Audra mentioned, for some member states, given their history even more so, uh, this is just not going to pass. And you're not going to see European disunity there. What you also, however, have to look at, and which is very important, and Mariangela and others touched on this, is how important it is for us as Americans and Europeans to be approaching this and to be looking at each other's needs in this process. It is not just simply saying, okay, we have to be united. We in Europe are facing the consequences of this war in a much more guttural, much more dramatic way than, than, than you are here in the States. Uh, we were talking this morning with, uh, with uh, Pennsylvania energy companies, uh, very grateful in Europe that we can decouple from Russia gas as fast as we have also because of massive exports of LNG from the US. At the same time, the prices are supremely high. The people in Europe are facing the possibility of an extremely expensive and difficult winter, this one and next one. This is not just simply about a gas deal. This is geostrategic. And I think everybody, Europeans and Americans, have to be approaching this as a geostrategic challenge. Unless we face this together and try to, uh, you know, share in the sacrifice of the consequences in the best possible way, in addition to sharing in the way that we are supporting together the Ukrainians, which is supremely important, and we are doing this very effectively, um, I think um, this, is the, this is the kind of top of mind thinking that, that we are having with the U.S. administration as we speak every day now about. So to the first question, I don't have much to add except that uh, on, the, on the military support that we're giving to Ukraine, there are other packages that are in preparation and, and uh, I don't see any, uh, any risk of um, changing direction, uh, quite on the contrary. Um, the nuclear threat is a threat. We we have to take it as as it is. is is a threat. Um, me me neither. I don't want to speculate is a bluff or not. Um, certainly, we know that in the military doctrine of of Russia, this is a possibility. So we uh, I don't think we we have to underestimate that, and we don't have to underestimate the. Um, how can I say? I, I I don't have the, the right word, but but uh, the unpredictability, or, or or the contrary, the the predictability of what of what uh, Putin uh, could do. Um, at the same time, I think we have to stay the course, and uh, what we are doing is really uh, making sure that Ukraine can not only defend itself but also advance uh, in uh, in uh, getting back its uh, its territory. On the second question, um, I don't see any change coming. Uh, so I don't know if this can, can reassure you. Um, Italy is a founding member, member of the European Union, is a member of NATO, um, is uh, a member of the United Nations, um, is a member of the, when, when there is a rotation of the Council of Human Rights, is, Italy is one of the most, um, uh, how can I say, uh, solid from those point of view, uh, democracy that you can, can find. Uh, so I don't see any, um, any change of course uh, at all. And by the way, um, we don't have a government yet, uh, but those who won the election were very clear on, on their support to Ukraine and, and the support to the... This Maloney. Yes. Yes, very much so. And for coalition partners, is, well, less so. I, I don't know if everyone is interested in, in this, but this this is going to be a coalition. Um, and I, I don't see I don't see problems. Uh, very frankly, this was very clearly said during the campaign. Um, I don't see any problem there. And uh, you know, we have election as uh, any other country uh, every five years. This was the time, and, and here we are. Fair enough. I I want to I want to bring in this this issue of 
<clears throat> I would think that you, uh, Russia's behavior towards Ukraine is probably least surprising to someone from Lithuania um, and is probably not very surprising to someone from Romania either. And I wanted to ask the, the, the two ambassadors, how, does you, how do you see your roles within the EU, within the West, as frontline states, as states that have dealt with, uh, with Russia uh, over the... Uh, that, that over the let's say over the last seven decades, but especially over the last two, um, do you find that there is a particular responsibility that you have, um, and how do you and how does that work in the councils of the EU when you talk about the Russians? I'll start with you, Ambassador Plepchenko, okay. please. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, some sometimes this year, or at least some some months now, we're hearing that you we can have a right to say we we told you so. I don't know whether it's uh, how to say. I'm not happy about that. I would prefer to to be be wrong. Yes, about that. But what they also what we are started what we started discussion of. Uh, I mean, we are so happy and and so proud about the the EU unity on on that. It's really it's exceptional how we worked uh, since since February imposing sanctions or uh, supporting Ukraine in, in, in that sense. Of course, we being on the front line and being some, so probably on many issues, we are still have stricter position or we know more, uh, we want more, maybe more sanctions, uh, more support to Ukraine. So I think as a Lithuania, we gave everything <laughs> we could in that sense or that, but we do understand that we, work in the big family family of 27 and it's it's i mean i can ensure that now it's much easier somehow we are hurt more and to be uh, um, among our like like-minded but what we stress as well of all, uh, us we have to not to have the fatigue or something we have to continue when they don't have any signs now that that could happen or something like that but that's i think that's the most important thing and it's not only on the inside of the EU, but it's very, very important as like transatlantic cooperation. And here we would like, maybe we didn't speak so much, US leadership as well. So internationally, that's an on global issue. It's very, very important. I think it's because of the US leadership, we had also this worldwide coalition in support of Ukraine and a sanction on that since the very beginning of the war. So that has to be also maintained and continued as well. So I think that that's very important. Ambassador Muraru, I'm, I'm thinking about Romania's situation. I'm also thinking Romania's next door neighbor, Moldova, with the frozen conflict in Transnistria, yeah. which existed long before. How does this all come together from, from your perspective and from your nation's perspective? Yeah, we have a particular experience with, with Russia. So in the last 150 years, we experienced 12 Russian invasions, the, the last one being in the 40s and 50s and, and not in the 19th century. Uh, so we see our responsibility there uh, as a member of NATO, a member of EU. And uh, I strongly believe that the response uh, of Romania to this crisis reflected how our relationship should look like with these two international organizations. So adaptable, effective, uh, goal focused and based on a fast and efficient decision making process. Um, speaking about uh, Moldova, as you pro probably know, Moldova is a very poor and weak country at this moment. So not member of EU, not member of NATO under uh, a Russian uh, uh, threat. Um, and uh, we have, of course, we share our past, we share our language, uh, we have very deep, lasting and sincere ties with, uh, with Moldova, and we coordinate closely uh, and we try to identify the best solutions and ways to, to uh, go forward. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we are, uh, and we were, so, uh, probably the strongest, the best, and uh, the most important advocate of uh, of Republic of Moldova in getting uh, the status they they got in the in June. You know the uh, to to um, um, being the being invited uh, to to uh, to be uh, one of. Uh, 
the EU candidates, and uh, we we reaffirmed our strong support for their independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty. And at the same time, uh, we continue to strongly support uh, the European Union aspirations of Republic of Moldova. Uh, of course, Moldova remains the neighbor worst impacted by Russian war in Ukraine. So after a few uh, months after the invasion, Moldova was at that time uh, the country with uh, the most important number uh, of refugees per capita. Uh, and in this context, uh, we supported them and will continue to provide cons constant and comprehensive assistance for, for them. I mean, we provided uh, them 100 million euro uh, uh, non-reimbursable uh, re funds for development projects, uh, budgetary assistance. Uh, we just uh, launched in a back in April a format together with France and Germany in order to gain more money to from different donors to help Moldova in the future because they have, of course, they have a very a sensitive problem of getting gas from, from Russia. Uh, and uh, at the same time, they need to do reform so they need more money and more money to, to cover all these crises they are facing through. I mean, not the refugee crisis, but also economic crisis, uh, uh, energy crisis. Uh, and uh, knowing Russia modus operandi, there were concerns from a string of provocations in Transnistria a few months ago. There are no indication at this time uh, of such attempts to, to increase tensions, but uh, we have to be um, um, very uh, careful of uh, what is going on right now in Chisinau. Just today morning, I read the a news that uh, uh, on, a, on a very uh, popular uh, Telegram account, account of uh, Russian militaries, so they, they spread the information that the mobilization started in Moldova, which is a fake news, you know, but uh, keeping this, this eye on Moldova uh, is very concerned for us. We have a question from, from the online audience. Go ahead, Lauren. Yes, um, we, two questions from online. Uh, the first is if, if there were a potential successor to Putin um, that could at some point in the future become the new president, uh, what's the reality of there being any actual negotiations to end the war? And then the second question is, considering China's position since the beginning of the invasion, how united is Europe on China-EU issues? Whoever wants to take it, I'm looking at you first, Ambassador. I, look, I, so um, I, the first question is interesting because, of course, we all are thinking about Russia's place in the world after this uh, this, uh, you know, extreme illegality is over with because Russia is there. It's a very big country. It's not going to go away. Uh, but to speculate on who might take over from Putin at which point and what they might look like, I think is too much of a speculation at this stage. But let me just say that we're all thinking uh, in Europe, um, in our own uh, foreign affairs discussions, but also with our American friends, um, what... Um, what a landing pad might be for a Russia of the future that is not uh, a constant uh, threat to its own people and to the rest of Europe and to, and to the world, and whether or not it is in any way that, uh, that the Russian people, um, uh, you know, and we can, can get to that point. Um, the, uh, the other question was about China, and I will say uh, that I'm very concerned about the fact that China has adopted all the disinformation rhetoric of Russia. Uh, and has multiplied around the world when it comes to things like um, why this war, why Russia allegedly had its hands forced to invade Ukraine. This is, of course, an uh, entire myth. Um, they decided to do it. No one was threatening them, NATO or anyone else. Uh, and even if they thought they were being threatened, there was a lot of discussion, including right before the invasion, that in theory could have uh, very much alleviated many of these concerns. They just, uh, Putin proved with his last speech that this was not an issue of negotiation. He had already gone to a space in his head of a grand Russia uh, that he was going to get by force, by violating uh, the UN Charter and all that stuff. Uh, but at the same time, interestingly, China has not, uh, in, our, in our estimation, um, um, actively tried to uh, circumvent or violate the sanctions or to support Russia militarily, at least not at this stage. And I think that's an important thing. Um, 
I will just say something about China and Russia uh, and, and the EU and the US and others in this context, because I mentioned about the disinformation. Look, at, we've done a very good job, I think, as Americans and Europeans in identifying um, who the uh, good guys, quote unquote, in this world are uh, and trying to create alliances around those who share you know, the values of openness, democracy, you know, uh, you know, non-use of force and all these things in most circumstances. Um, we've been pretty good at identifying who the bad guys are, quote unquote. So who, those who are ideologically, politically committed against that. But in my view, we've done a pretty, um, well, we could do much better, if you like, in trying to identify and approach those countries that are neither committed good guys or committed bad guys with all the backs and forwards, those over 100 countries around the world arguably sitting on the fence. So neither committed against multilateralism, uh, but also not convinced that the West or other powers around the world with competing interests really have their own interests at heart. And this battle of narratives and values are going to play out not between the good guys and the bad guys, but it's going to play out around the world in those areas in Africa and Latin America and Asia. And unless we are smart enough in diplomacy, in economy, to be able to approach those countries in a convincing way, with convincing actions and narratives, um, we may lose them. And if we lose them, then it's going to be a very different world. And I'm concerned if we'll get down that line. So this is what I'm focusing on more than anything else right now, uh, looking at how we can get to that point with all these countries. Fair enough. For the other members of the panel, uh, Ambassador Zappia? Well, just just um, really taking over from what Ambassador Lambenese just said. Um, I think there are, there are two things that I want to say. One is that our security is not only in Europe. Um, of course, we, are, we have a war in Europe right now, um, but our security is really fought every day, everywhere. Um, and this comes a little bit to what Ambassador Lambrinisi was saying. So our security is also in Africa. Our security is in Asia. Our security is in Latin America. We, we cannot ignore um, the rest of the world, the challenges that they have. And, uh, and as democracies and, and those who want to give the example, we, we really have to have that in mind all the time. Um, which brings me to the system that we have in place, this multilateral system, this system of, of rules uh, that thanks, thanks God is, is holding, uh, but this is something that we need to defend, not only thinking in terms of us against them and what them. Uh, so there is a, a, a very fundamental question that I believe we have to, to be able to answer together, which is how do we, how do we deal with autocracies? Because they're not going to, to go away. <laughs> uh, how do we deal with that? And how, how really uh, we, we show that our model is, uh, is a better model. And the only way to show that is, uh, first of all, to look at the needs of our citizens um, being able to deliver for our citizens uh, and then being able to um, look at our own security, as I was saying before, as something that is much larger than our courtyard. Uh, Please. Has a very yeah. recent, I would say, no. especially with, with, with China, there are certain, China. certain issues to be brought up. Please. Yeah. yeah, but I think many comments, many, I mean, to what was said as well, especially even if before we knew how sometimes we cannot rely on authoritarian regimes or, or something, which is so this war and now the forging alliance were very clear who is who more or less shows how importantly we have to be more or less together to to trying to to create more resilient our economies our political world and chain of supplies and and, and everything so i think that is this that is clear and it's very important it's not only two or three countries or lots but it's 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 global it's the whole world as well and that's why we have to that's very true yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Ambassador Lamprinides just said. 
uh, about China and other actors. So uh, let us not forget that we have very uh, important doc documents like EU strategic compass and the NATO strategic concept. So both countries, Russia and China, are there. Uh, and uh, the two organizations, so NATO and the EU, uh, adopted, uh, adopted uh, these documents after close consultations between the two organizations, uh, which provides, of course, another baseline for the future. But the main problem is going to be to implement those decisions that uh, we've taken. And at the same time, to, to Romania, so we decided to uh, split up in a way with uh, with this uh, kind of uh, actors, which are not like-minded actors. I mean, uh, Romania adopted four laws in the, the last two years, you know, expelling China from our nuclear plant, from our 5G networks, from our infrastructure projects. Uh, it was not easy at all, but uh, if you want to, you know, to work with uh, with partners like-minded, you have to, to cut off uh, with uh, with the others, and uh, and we did it with a broad political consensus, which is uh, which is great. This is our perspective. And, and I would say, right, the the issue of political consensus. We are talking when we talk about democracies versus autocracies. Is we all have to recognize that within our democratic societies, there will be differences of opinion. We'll have elections. There will be different political parties. There will be a range of attitudes on foreign policy questions. How we handle our disagreements is also part of how we deal with the rest of the world. We show them that we're capable of doing And if I may just say very quickly, because I see all the yeah, number of questions. But yes, this is without a doubt a battle of democracies against autocracies, okay? And we know it and we discuss it here. But in line of what, with what I said before about the country sitting on the fence, I think the worst thing that we can do to communicate to the world what this is about is to present it as a battle of the West against Russia. This is not that. It is the West and the East, the North and the South for Ukraine, for the principles of the UN Charter that might is not right, that you don't violate an independent country's borders just because you have the weapons and the desire to wipe them off the map. That is something that resonates in too many countries in Africa, certainly, who do not have great neighbors around, too many countries in Asia and Latin America. We have to get smarter in the way we communicate this, not because what I just told you is actually a false narrative that we're just using for other countries. This is, in fact, what is at stake. What is at stake is the international legal order decided by so many countries around the world when the UN Charter was, was signed up to, and this is what we're defending. Excellent. Yes. Joe Field, please. Open the microphone over to you, Joe. Uh, ben Pribyatak, I'm a member of FPRI. What, uh, my mind keeps want, running to the Russian-Finnish winter war of 1940 and, uh, and what parallels uh, that might provide, what guidance it might provide, and what parallels might be a little misleading. Um, and I wonder uh, if you have any comments uh, about that, one of the one of the outcomes, a short short lived outcome, was uh, Russia's uh, expulsion from the League of Nations. Um, and uh, you know, I'm wondering uh, what an effort might look like, and uh, what you think the utility of an attempt to expel Russia. As you said, one of the Putin's strategic objectives appears to be t the tearing up of the UN Charter. Clearly, his actions are in violation of the UN Charter. Um, that 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 point is uh, prima facie and and you know clear to everybody. Um, so anyway, I, I wonder if you could address that. Please, Ambassador Zapia, you worked at the uh, UN among other places. Yeah, which is probably why um, why I believe we shouldn't do that. Uh, not now. Not not uh, if you think of some of the things that we were able to do in this uh, conflict, the UN has played a huge role. Um, when you think about um, food security, the UN was able to negotiate something for uh, grain supply to, to start again, for instance. I understand that in the Security Council is almost impossible, impossible to take decisions because, because of the stalemate. I, 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 I see that. I saw that again very clearly 
for the pandemics. Uh, so for something that was killing everyone uh, around the world, but there was a, a political stalemate, a geopolitical stalemate, that it was impossible for the Security Council to take uh, uh, to take any decision. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why we, as a country, we advocate for a Security Council reform um, that doesn't have, you know, more permanent members and more veto and more because it doesn't work. But this is not what I wanted to say. What I want to say is that we have to keep that space for negotiation and the UN is still a space of negotiation. And the last thing I want to say is that uh, after the expulsion of, of, of Russia uh, and the Soviet Union at the time in uh, uh, from the League of Nations, well, everything went very wrong in the world and, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the League of Nations was, was dissolved and then... And, and, you know what happened so my insti instinct is to keep this but it's clear that the violation of international law that Russia is uh, committing are completely against the chart that's 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 uh, that's clear now is that uh, a reason to expel Russia I don't know I, I I think we have to keep the space as much as possible uh, as a place when where negotiation can maybe happen the day that there is a possibility for that to happen. But other you were in the UN. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were saying we were together with Maria Angela together all these four years in the UN. But I wanted to uh, go back to the Finnish war. For us, that was a huge, in, when we study history, the Finnish war was, how to say, um, example how we had to behave. I mean, we Lithuania in 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 the forties when we were occupied because we were in that time four Baltic states, three Baltic states, and Finland was as well. And the only uh, Finland which really said no to to Soviet occupation and they fought. So that's everybody was saying, ah, we had to also fight when it was that to show. And I think Ukrainians did that very well. I mean, now they showed how you have to fight the aggress as well. So they, they show the leadership in that. And I think it's also that why we have this coalition in support for Ukraine as well, because of the leadership and and, and, and showing that. So it's one of one how to say example or or lessons learned from the Finnish war. Another thing, uh, the the international coalition to support of Finland during the Finnish war. And what we have as well today in the case of Russian aggression against Ukraine. There's many, many countries that I would say global coalition probably supporting Ukraine. So we have to we have to do that as well to to, uh, to support until the as I said victory of uh, of Ukraine as it was in in Finnish case as well. They lost some territories, but actually they, they won. I would say as well, something like that. So we have to ensure that Ukraine wants. And regarding that, I won't discuss the United Nations or something. I love United Nations. But what we have, we see so many atrocities committed by Russian soldiers and Russia in Ukraine. So what in the end of the war, what has to be in the, is accountability. That is also, if you want to solve this issue, the accountability has to be there. So as well, we have also from UN or some other tribunals or something, that example. So we have to, to, to work on that as well. And international organization, United Nations is also one of the places. So I have, a, I have a question back here and then I'll come back to Trudy. We've got about five minutes left. So we'll uh, try to get a couple more questions in. Thank you, Ron. Um, I will. I will protect. I'll. I'll protect your schedule as much as you'll let me protect your schedule. That's all right. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Good. All right. Good. All right. I have Go a two-part question. We, during this conversation, there's been slight mentions about the upcoming energy crisis. I'm curious to know: Do you see areas or methods where the U.S. as a whole can, I guess, support the EU with this inevitable crisis? And I guess the second part, um, on a smaller level. As you move into the winter and it becomes, I guess, more of a reality for uh, citizens in the EU, how do you envision balancing, I guess, that issue at home versus the need for continued unity uh, against this aggression as it prolongs? So, if I may, very quickly, the US has already been a strategic partner of us in this energy crisis. 
About 30% of all your exports of LNG to the world went to Europe last year. This number is up to 60% today. We have managed to fill our um, gas reserves in Europe to about 87, 88% up to now, which would allow us, no matter what Russia does, a, uh, a, a contained and containable winter uh, away from a major crisis. And that's also because of those US exports. President Biden and President von der Leyen in Europe agreed that in the next few years, the US will be giving, uh, will be providing Europe with close to 50 BCMs. It's a volume of LNG, of gas. Um, uh, we were relying, uh, we were getting 150 BCMs from Russia until recently. Uh, so that's one third of all the needs of Europe, but we've already gone way down. So I would say that the cooperation there is great. Now, your second question, um, we are ready for this winter. Next winter is going to be a little uh, trickier because the Chinese economy will open up uh, and therefore there's going to be more demand for LNG coming from China and elsewhere. That is where what I said before matters. It, it, you, the U.S. has to, we, I hope, look at this not just as a regular gas in the world sort of supply demand situation, but as a geostrategic interest to ensure that the alliance against Putin remains strong that the European economy does not, at some point, because of different points of interest or demand of gas, uh, have the danger of not being uh, supplied with enough gas from around the world. So a lot of strategic thinking is already taking place right now on this. Uh, but also the issue of pricing is very important. Uh, prices are very, very high. Uh, we in Europe are already taking measures to ensure that the companies that we have producing electricity, whether they are renewable, energy companies producing electricity or fossil fuel companies share in the burden of this particular war crisis. So they do not make exorbitant profits, but we were able to use some of the extreme profits that have been created with the huge gas increases and non increases to be able to support our member states to support their citizens as they're paying high prices. So it's a very delicate and complex puzzle, but the pieces are there. And if we're able to put them together, Americans and Europeans, we're going to be in a very good place. I believe each of us um, has different level of dependency from, from Russian gas, but Europe is dependent from Russian gas. Uh, what we have been doing from the very beginning of this crisis, seeing very well where it was going, um, has been to, to really uh, put in place all possible means to diversify as, as quickly as possible, to cut uh, Russian supplies as quickly as possible. In my country, but other countries did the same. In my country, we, we really uh, cut by half our dependence from, from Russian gas. We have uh, capacity for this winter. Uh, we are coordinating with our partners in case there are differences, but because there will be differences. There are countries that are even more dependent than us. Uh, Germany, uh, just to, 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 to make one example, more dependent than us, but also other. How do we help each other in the European Union? This is also a discussion that is happening. We are diversifying. Uh, in the case of Italy, we have been looking south, of course, uh, to our other partners. So it's Algeria, it's Egypt, uh, but it's also Azerbaijan on, on, uh, on um, Central Asia, uh, is all our African friends. This is also why I was talking before about the need to see security as something that is global. It's not only Russia and the gas that comes from Russia, it's really global. Um, and this is why we have to take care much more of this famous South, Global South. The Global South is very big, um, plenty of opportunities there, but right now also plenty of challenges. Uh, and when we think of wars, of course, we have a big war in Europe. I think I, the last thing I, I would have thought in my life was to see again this war in Europe. But there are wars everywhere. Um, there are wars everywhere, and these are very often in, uh, in poor countries, in countries that are uh, totally unstable, and at the same time, countries that are so important for us in terms of energy security. So we need to understand, a, we need to uh, embrace a much larger 
concept of um, security, strategic interest, uh, and also energy security. So, Trudy Rubin, we gave you the first question. We'll give you the last one since time's about up. The microphone's coming to you. I would just like to follow up on a couple of points that have been discussed. I'm wondering whether Putin's declaration of annexation has changed the whole landscape. I mean, things are moving so fast now, both with that declaration and with the advances uh, that the Ukrainians are making and the collapse of Russian fronts in the east and in the south. Um, after that declaration, is it really possible to contemplate negotiations with Putin? If it isn't, um, that is the line that President Macron and, uh, um, and Chancellor Schultz have been pursuing. Uh, does that position somehow have to shift? And if it does, what does that mean? So I'd like to follow up on that. If one can't negotiate so long as Putin is sitting in the chair, then does that mean there should be greater support for Ukraine militarily now, leopard tanks from Germany, whatever they need to try to finish this as soon as possible before it drags on? The second point is that the question of if Putin would use a tactical nuclear weapon is obviously on the table. In Kiev, they're giving out iodine tablets. Now, uh, no strategic expert seems to think that's in the offing soon, but General Petraeus was on TV yesterday saying that Putin should be warned that if he contemplated such a thing that NATO would respond harshly, including destroying all Russian bases in Crimea and uh, uh, and military uh, uh, installations inside Ukraine. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether that is a subject on the table in uh, the EU, uh, how to think ahead of the curve just in case, since things are moving so fast, Putin gets so desperate that he does something that can't win him the war, but could get us into a new era. So it's good that uh, that we got all the big questions uh, out of the way. So we have about uh, two minutes left. Does anybody want to talk about the prospect of nuclear destruction? Or no, I'm serious. The uh, so how do we imagine negotiations um, with if Putin comes out and says, "I'm fighting against Satanism," right? If somebody threatens to kill you, you can't say, "Well, let's negotiate." How about you just beat me up for a little while, right? I mean, clearly there has to be. You know, how do we what what do we negotiate about, Ambassador? Yeah, uh, so. I would like to, to point out that uh, Moscow uh, rationally behind this aggression, namely the denial of the right of the uh, Ukrainian people to existence and statehood. Uh, so it is a de facto Russian policy to recreate spheres of influence. They organized this, this, the so-called referenda in occupied territories. So from my perspective, there is no way to negotiate until Russia uh, is, uh, is uh, expelling from, from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the war realities uh, uh, are that Russia has to be, uh, you know, uh, or Russian leaders has to, to be put uh, on a court, you know, to, to in front of justice, because without that, uh, something similar could be could could happen in in the future. A, a last statement uh, in res responding to that question or on uh, on anything else, but thank you, Mr. Mr. Ambassador. Please, Madam Ambassador. Yeah, on negotiations. I mean, I, I think it's up to Ukraine to say when and how to negotiate. And I think they were very clear as well on that. And I think more, more Putin's puts, I think more stronger, we have to be united and, and, and not, to, uh, not to step back in that because that's what he wants, I think, to, to step us back as well in intimidating and fighting all this nuclear or, or something like that. So just more like a final final remark. I just wanted as well to, to, to appeal to everyone and to ensure that we have to be united and strong in supporting Ukraine and uh, not to blinking against the Russian intimidations and, and, and that's so we don't have to, we, we, we cannot under 
underestimate Russia or something, but we have to be really united and even strong in our support to Ukraine. That's I think that's that would be the the best tool of, of future negotiation and solving this to to ensure the Ukraine. That's really on the same lines. I think is no one of here can can tell which are the negotiating conditions this is this is really ukraine that has to to decide uh and our duty is to support ukraine as much as possible in defending itself um this is really what we're doing and i agree that you know we we, we have to keep that strength um negotiation has to be i think um, from a from a uh, principal point of view, something that you never denied. The, the, there is always a possibility, but certainly is not for us to tell which are the conditions for negotiation. Last word, Ambassador Lambert. So, um, like like I said before, you should not expect annexation and nuclear threats to actually divide Europe into saying oh we are too afraid now uh therefore we'll stop supporting ukraine that's just simply not going to happen and 27 eu leaders came and said this out very openly together a couple of days ago that's not the issue the issue is how do you get out of a very complex situation into a place that perhaps you can have um you know the the uh, a, 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 any kind of resolution and there of course ukraine's and the ukrainian people's will is one of going to determine this to a large extent. Uh, keep in mind, they're being wiped out of the face of the earth right now. This is uh, this is Russia's effort, uh, and uh, and we are fully supporting them because the uh, what is at stake is, is is Ukraine and its future, but of course much more than that, as I've said before. But let's not forget what the epicenter of this storm is, and that is Russia's decision to demonstrate that the world has changed through its ability, its desire to wipe off a country doesn't like off the map. This has to stop. And this is where the Ukrainians play an important role. Now, nuclear weapons, listen, you may have heard what the US administration have said in the past week or so. They, they have warned uh, Russia about quote unquote catastrophic consequences. I think you shouldn't have any doubt that there have been discussions with Russia about what may come. Now, I am not going to tell you that I am privy to the details of those conversations. I don't know if anyone of us is, but I can tell you that I am privy to the fact that they have taken place and that the messages that have been communicated are not kumbaya. Fair enough? Okay. Well, they, they, it's not kumbaya. It's, it's the real thing. Okay? Now, will he do it? What he do, what he not? You know, I, I'll just close with this. I, I just, I, I don't even know. So, Gary Kasparov, you all know him. Uh, you know, uh, a very famous, uh, you know, world champion in chess, uh, a, a Russian dissident as well, political dissident. Um, uh, I invited him to a meeting of our, uh, uh, you know, um, EU ambassadors. We meet once a month um, uh, after Russia had invaded. And he was there and I asked him, I wish I hadn't, but how do you avoid the question? So, Gary, if this were a chess match, uh, you know, <laughs> so I asked it this way. And he said, you know, thank you for the question. I'll tell you what, I'm a chess player, he said, okay? I know how to play chess. Chess has very, very clear rules, but very unclear outcomes. Putin doesn't like rules. He likes outcomes that, that work for himself. Putin is not a chess player, he said. He's a poker player. You have to keep this in mind. Putin, the weaker the hand he has, the more he will try to bluff you into folding. Never forget that that is what a great poker player does. He is a great poker player. Uh, don't use the chess analogy. Use the use the poker analogy. Analogy. I think that is interesting advice to to keep in mind uh, when uh, when this guy comes out and uh, and threatens. But as Maria Angela uh, said, as everyone said uh, here, um, um, it is a threat. It's entirely unacceptable. It is putting doubling down on a failed strategy up to now, but he's doing it. Uh, and so we are preparing for uh, the bluff and we're preparing for the no bluff. And if it's no bluff, good luck to Putin, to be honest. 
That's a great line to end on. I'm sorry that we are about out of time for today, but I want to thank the ambassadors for joining us. Today. Ambassador Lambrinidis, Ambassador Zapia, Ambassador Pleptita, and Ambassador Muraru. Thanks so much for joining us today in Philadelphia. Thanks very much to everybody who supports the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia and the Foreign Policy Research Institute. See you next time.